Heaven. We're going to title this lecture, Heaven Is. I remember many, many years ago, the old professor, when I, the father let me know that the ministry was something that I should think very seriously about. He said, ministering is a very simple thing. That is, never forget the four W's. And if you'll remember that one thing, you'll have the principles of teaching. And it's that simple. That's who, what, when, and where. And when you get those things said, sit down. <laughs> okay. When you tell who it is, what it is, where it is, and when it is, you got it made. He said, basically, that's the secret to a good ministry. He said, now go forth and learn all of the who's, what's, when's, and where's, <laughs> which that can be quite a project. But sometimes we let a little word like heaven, which we really, that's, that's what it's all about. That's what we're all working forward to. Sometimes we let a little word like that, we put it back in our mind, yes, that's up there. It's out there. That's where I'm going. Heaven, basically, as man would describe it, is where the ark of the clouds is, up high. You know, everything up is better, like the head's better than the feet. It's just man's way of thinking. And, but God's Word makes it very clear where heaven is, who's going to be there, where it is, and what your part is in it. So I thought we would just really take some very basics and simply find out for ourselves whereby we could document it in our Father's Word, whereby we could explain this to anyone's satisfaction, and perhaps find out where we're going in this heavenly place. So we're going to do that. I want you to open your Bibles, if you would, to that great book of Isaiah, chapter 62. Chapter 62 tells us where heaven's going to be. And don't, don't ever be one of these Christians, as I've always taught you. The most simple explanation of where it is is wherever God is. Wherever God is, that's where heaven is. Why? It's heaven to be with him. But he's not necessarily always in one spot. But he has a spot that is his favorite picked out. Just like many of you have that favorite spot where in this old nature you can go there and just you just feel at home. Well, he has such a place that in Ezekiel chapter 16, he performed a marriage with Yahushalem, which is to say the land of Judea. Not in his present condition, certainly, but that geographical location is his loved, longed-for spot in the universe. Well, naturally, it's quite simple to say, well, wherever God is, that's where heaven is. And that's, that is a true statement. So let's go into the Scripture here now and analyze it. And we find in chapter 62, verse 1, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. That gives you the geographical location of heaven. That's what God's desire is, is to make it that place of righteousness. His throne shall sit there. Zion is the mountain on which David built the temple, with the throne being on the north side thereof, and it shall be reclaimed. That's what he's saying. I'm not going to rest. You may think I'm asleep, but I know very well what's going on, and I have my eye on it. Verse 2, And the Gentiles, or the nations perhaps better translated, shall see thy righteousness. And understand, this is speaking to that geographical location, not an individual. Okay? And all kings, thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name. What is that new name? Which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Nobody else is going to name you. You're my bride. You're mine. I'm going to name you. Thou shalt, in verse 3, also be a crown of glory. That's a bridal crown. That's the crown that the bride wears. In the land of the Lord. And a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. I'm going to use you. 
God has a purpose for that same mount. That same mount that Moses took Isaac up to, placed him on an altar, and at the order of God raised the sword to take his life, and God said, Stop! He spared the life and offered instead a substitute sacrifice. It was the same area that Christ was delivered up, in the same temple, the same mount, that brought about the crucifixion. I did not say the crucifixion took place. It did take place on one of the mounts that is a part of that chain verse of the crucifixion, that is to say. Verse 4, Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah. What does that mean? It means my delight is in her. That's what God says. I look at her, my delight is on that Mount Zion. That's the new name, my delight. And thy land, that is to say all the land that, that um, encircles it, called Beulah. Do you know what Beulah means? Married. I'm going to marry her. Now, this is an analogy that is used by our Father to let you know how He feels about that geographical location. He loves it. Whether it is the center of the universe or whether it is just simply He likes that particular place, again, as you might like some place, you may not have a reason other than you feel good there. Zion is His place. And He did marry her in that 16th chapter of Ezekiel for an eternity, forever. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married, joined to me. If the land is joined to our Father, it means certainly he's going to be there. For as a young man marrieth a, a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoice over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. He's going to be happy there. There's one thing about heaven, or anything connected with it, there is always happiness, for there's no room there for anything that would offend, negative thoughts, so forth. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day or night. Yet ye that make mention of the Lord keep not silent. Do you know who that is? Inasmuch as our Father took those watchmen and scattered them throughout the world, the ten tribes going over the Caucasus Mountains, settling Europe, many later coming to this nation, and yes, Canada, the Christian nations of the world, so to speak. They are those watchmen that are supposed to remind people of this. This is God's spot. We watch over her, that city of peace, for it is the home of the Prince of Peace. That is to say, Yahweh's Savior. When you say Yeshua or Jesus in English, that's what you're saying. Our Father's Savior. Don't keep silent about it. And give him no rest or silence till he establish, until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. It's going to be. Not now, but it's going to be. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength, who sits at the right hand of the Father? The Son, of course. Surely I will no more give thy corn to be eat of thy, for thine enemies, and the sons of the stranger shall not drink thy wine, for the which thou hast labored. Do you know why that's going to be? Because there will be no stranger there. They will be either a child of God or they will not exist when he takes residence there, for it will be in the eternal age, not even the millennium age. The full Godhead de facto does not return until the last day of the millennium. There shall be no strangers. All will be again children of God, or they will not exist. But they that have gathered it shall eat it and praise the Lord. And they that have brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. There will be no high taxation. There will be no usury. There will be no middlemen. There will be no profit takers of the poor and those that are not 
sharp mentally, whereby they allow people to mess them out of their goods, take advantage of them, out-deal, wheel, and deal, thinking of this, that, and the other. No more of that. Everything you have will be your own. And whatever you want, work for it. And it is yours. Go through, go through thy, the gates. Prepare ye the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway. Gather out the stones and lift up a standard for the people. Have you done that lately? It's something you're supposed to do. It's still the message to those watchmen. That standard, of course, is Christ. And I thank God that he has given us a platform whereby we are able now to wave that flag, that standard, around this world, right here from this little location. I thank our Father for that. It's the membership has made it possible that it goes around the world as well. And we're going to keep waving it, for it means, quite simply put forth, bring truth. There is only one truth, and it is the word of your Father not the word of man. And that word shall continue. I think, our Father, that when the truth is taught to a starving world, that it multiplies. Boy, can you ever, does that ever increase your faith in mankind? That they're good, basically. They've just been deceived and woolly woggled a little bit, as we might say over in Oklahoma. Just woolly woggled around a little bit. But they love God's Word. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed unto the end of the world. That's how long. Say ye to the daughter of Zion. That's the children that is spouse from there, meaning God's children. Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. It might come as a shock to some that on the last day of this earth age and on that day that Christ returns, he's taking a bride that he's not that proud of. And secondly, there's still work to do. If you think the work's going to be over when Christ comes, you're sadly mistaken. Well, there's going to be a thousand-year reign of teaching and work the saving of souls that had not an opportunity to learn the truth. That's why this verse, which so strongly states the second advent, states in the closing phrase, uh, uh, segment of the sentence, and his work be for him. Not behind, before. And it's going to be a precious work a time of teaching that there will be no adversary present, but he shall be locked in the abyss. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. No, that city will not be forsaken. God has his eye upon Mount Zion. He has an eternal covenant made with it, as I forestated in Ezekiel chapter 16. It's his home, his place, and he's going to take it. He has ambassadors or watchmen that he has set forth. Think about it. Some of you have a purpose, and it may be just a very small stone that you're able to kick out of the pathway, a stone of offense that might cause some person to slip. Were they to say, example, ask you a question, and you not be able to answer it? There's no, there's no sin in not being able to answer a question, but to be familiar with the tools of study whereby you know where to find it. That's the thing, to be a blessing to people, to help remove those stones from their lives as well as your own. Where's heaven? Well, we're going to drift around out on a cloud. No, if heaven is where God is, it's going to be in that place. That's it. That's the where. It's eternal. God swore by his right hand, all right, the right hand, which is the hand of strength. That's the way it's going to be. You can count on it. Not bumping around in the clouds, but on that mount with many people coming there. Now, what about the people? I, I love the terms that 
our Father utilizes. He uses terms that your own present emotions can relate to so that you know how he feels. And that's how he speaks. That's why Christ comes to take a bride. That's why spiritually he wants to receive a virgin. Because he wants someone that has not believed necessarily on a false Christ or the prince of this world, but have patiently waited for him. You'll find that in Isaiah chapter 54. We're just going to cover some of it. This has to do with who will be there, so to speak. Who were those watchmen? Who? Some of you have a destiny and a purpose. God's going to use you. Do you remember when Christ was carrying that cross up to Golgotha, which is in that same frame of mountains, Mount Zion? He said, the day will come. Don't weep for me, daughters of Jerusalem. That's the, this wonderful place, heavenly place. But rather weep for yourselves, for the day shall come when it shall be said, Blessed are those that are barren. And it falls back on that great saying he made in Mark 13 concerning his return at the second advent, Woe to those that are with child, which quite simply means it doesn't mean a mother carrying a child in her womb, but it means those that have spiritually married a false Christ, have accepted a false one. Don't be taken in, as the majority will be, by the instead of Christ. That's what he's talking about. God told woman and man at their creation, go forth and replenish this earth with children. There is, it is a blessed event to give birth. There's nothing wrong with it. But spiritually, at the second advent, bad news. If Christ returns for a wedding and finds the majority of his children already wed to another. Or he's going to wed her, for on the first day of the millennium every knee will bow to him. But he's not too proud of her. He's not too happy about her. But at the end of the millennium, after Satan has released that short season, then he shall be pleased, for all that offends will be removed. Isaiah 54 lets us know who. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing. You that were not wrapped up in the spiritual deception of the end hour, and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate. This is shamin in the uh, Hebrew. It means those that were stupefied or slumbered, if you would, better put, as mentioned in Romans chapter 11 when God sent the spirit of stupor upon some, whereby they would not be accountable for the sin they would commit. Then the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Who is this married wife? That married wife is the ones Jesus spoke of through great Paul, that teacher. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, I chose you before the foundations of the earth. Chose you for what? For a wife speaking in a spiritual sense only, whereby you can understand the emotions of your father. Now, I know you've all heard me many times say, so that you can really understand why it's important to him that you are barren when he returns, you're his children, or basically you're his wife if you're one of God's elect, because you were chosen at the cabal, the overthrow, and were justified and were taken in. Now, the reason he uses that, it does not take too much of an imagination if you've ever loved someone or if you've ever been married to someone and you go away for three or four years and come back and they have a suckling child. You're not happy about it. Or vice versa, using the female. That's how God feels. It hurts. You hurt your father when you are unfaithful spiritually to him. He uses that analogy whereby he says to you, children, don't you know I have feelings too? I'm not just some big force or power sitting out here in space. I've got feelings just like you have. Therefore, you were created in my image, meaning my likeness. You are a phantom of me. You could even translate it from the Hebrew. So, as you hurt, he hurts when you're unfaithful to him spiritually. That's why he wants you to be 
barren. That means not involved when he returns to his wife. Enlarge, verse 2 of that same chapter in uh, Isaiah 54. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. Meaning, you're going to work, and your family is going to grow to the point that your tent's not going to hold them, and that's good. It is an analogy that means our work, even in that millennium age, will be very fruitful. People will finally see the truth. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the nations. May I translate it that way, because that's what it is in the Hebrew. The Gentile nations, yes, but the nations, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. There will be no more astonishment of deception, but people will be able to see and know the truth. Now, when is this going to happen? It explains it. Listen, fear not. For thou shalt not be ashamed. Now, do you enjoy being ashamed? Well, then stick around sliding away from God's Word, because in the very near future there's going to be many with red faces that call themselves Christians and true followers of Christ. For there's a false one coming, and they, they don't know. You'll never be ashamed, neither be thou confounded or confused or deceived, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, that is to say, all your sins that you might have committed in that respect before the fact, and shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. Even when the false ones call themselves married and with child, and you feel that you have to still, and you must carry that standard. As they said, do you not remember old Mystery Babylon, that great harlot who says, I'm a queen, I'm not a widow. You're going to feel a little lonely at that time, but remember this, you're never alone. God is with you. Okay, uh, verse 5. For, listen carefully, for thy maker is thine husband. Always has been, always will be, and you're only a widow if you, wish, if you choose to use it in that respect in a spiritual sense, but he's still with you. The Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. That, that, the, to indicate and to stress, emphasize to you, that's talking about universal domain. Domain is half the word of kingdom, the king's dominion. It's everywhere and everything. What I'm telling you is, is your husband owns it all. All of it. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth when thou wast refused, saith thy God. It doesn't matter that the world might refuse you. He shall not when you plow deep and when you stay in his word. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. For a small moment. It's been 2,000 years, Lord. How, what your father wants you to know and probably had learned through this is patience. How long is a day with the Lord? Second Peter chapter 3. Be not ignorant of this one thing, that to God a thousand years with man is as one day with God. It's only been a week since this whole thing started way back in the beginning to our father. Just a week, just a moment. And when you are in the eternity, it will seem like but that moment also. And the thing is, the real truth of that, that particular verse is this. He may have left you alone physically, that is to say, you're walking around here, but he's not away from you, all right? He's still with you. He's still in control, in charge, your husband, spiritually speaking has got his hand on the hammer. It isn't nice or healthy for someone to move against God's elect. He does not like it. And he takes vengeance, for vengeance belongeth to him. So, you're in good shape. That's what he's telling you, okay? You're in real good shape. You're his honey. You're his deer. And I'm, I'm in the spiritual sense. 
Verse 8, In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me, a promise. Remember, he promised Noah, hey, I'm, every time you see a rainbow, it's not going to rain. It's not, I'm not going to flood the earth again. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountain shall depart and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. Do you know how to obtain that mercy? Oh, God, life is just rough to be all over. If anybody gets a good break, it's sure not me. Well, you poor baby. You poor sniveling little ki- whatever. All right? You obtain mercy by what? By asking for it. It's yours. You claim it. You get a blessing from God because you bless Him. Don't bless Him. I guarantee you, you'll never get blessed. That's fair, Right? Our, I like, God's got feelings just like you do. Again, you ignore Him, hey, he'll, <laughs> you're asking for it. Don't blame anybody but yourself. Mercy means unmerited favor. Number one, let's get the scratch board. Let's just whoosh, pull her up and erase everything on it. And realize that all of us mess up. We all fall short. But if you go to Him and repent, He erases, He gives you unmerited favor, which means you don't deserve it. But He gives it to you anyway. Thank you, Father, for that, because we all, again, fall short. And there's not a one of you in this room that your little old mind can't go back very far and say, Oh, thank you, Jesus. All right? He wipes the board clean. For this is... Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and lay thy foundations with sapphires. You're going to have it made. And I will make thy windows as of agates and the gates of carbuncles and all uh, thy borders of pleasant stones. Nothing that would offend around you, beloved. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. That's... After the millennium, yes, we've gone to that point now. In righteousness shall be, in righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear. And from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Are you afraid of anything? If you are, if you're afraid of something, there's something wrong. God give you a mind and a way to figure or outwit or outsmart Satan or anything he might send against you. If you start flying down a blind canyon and you don't have enough power to climb up out of that canyon, you're going to naturally pick the widest spot you can in that canyon and you're going to try a 180. You're going to get out of there, you know, and you're going to go back a different way. You're not going to quit. It's just you're going to find a better way. Well, do that in your daily lives. You can always find a better way if it's not working for you. Something's wrong because everything works for God's children. It's all going to work out. But you've got to do a little work for it. He is your comforter. He is your assistant. That doesn't mean he's going to do it for you. He's going to assist you do it. Assist you to do it. All right? But you're the one that's got to do it. So be real careful. Especially in this year we're starting, there's going to be some fantastic things in this year. And we're coming up to that time that prophecy passes by so fast that it's difficult to even keep up with it. And sometimes we're like in the horse and buggy days when it comes to defeating problems. Come on, come on, modernize, get into the high tech of God's Word. That simply means understand it and live now. You don't have to wait, live now. Okay. Behold, thou shalt surely, behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me, whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Nobody can win against you if you're doing it right. That's why it's important that you do do it right. 
Do you mean to say that again? Nobody, nobody can win against you if you're doing it right. Why? God's going to insist on it. Again, he's got his hand on the hammer. Think about it. Use common sense. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire. Do you know what you, know what you have to do with metal to bend it or something, a man? you got to heat that rascal until it's about ready to melt and you can handle it like a wet noodle. Almost, you know. Well, he said, I, I created the old boy that built the fire and the coal, the nature of the coal itself, or the coke or whatever they call it. I, I made that. Don't forget, he's your husband. He's got his hand on the hammer. And that bringeth forth an instrument for, for his work, and I have created the waster to destroy. He even created Satan. That's what he's saying. Satan was a child of God till he went bad. But his point to you is this. What are you afraid of? I'm the man in charge. I can handle it. I can bend it. I can shape it. I can do it. I'm a can-do God for you if you will listen. If you will love me. Don't hurt him, beloved. Give him pleasure every day by saying, Father, I love you. Do you know what? Just get set for a blessing. I guarantee you, you're going to get one. I really believe that with all my heart. If you mean it from your heart when you tell him, I love you, Father, you're going to get blessed. He always pays. Why? It's real simple. He's got his hand on the hammer. Maybe I'm overusing that. He has his hand on the ice cream venda. And he vendas out the ice cream, all right? I'm saying that for the younger group we have with us today. I think it, is that working better than the hammer, little ones? All right, all right. He handles out the ice cream, all right? I handle it, he says. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. What are you going to condemn it with? God's word. Quite frankly, there won't be a tongue rise against you unless it's against God's Word if you're in His Word. This is the heritage. Do you understand that word heritage? It's, you know what happens if somebody dies and they got a million dollars and you're the only one in the will? That's your inheritance. That's what heritage is. You inherit. This is what you get, all right, of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. All righteousness is of God. Our righteousness falls far short. But he blots out that that offends. So, who's going to be in heaven? God's wife. He said, I can't hardly wait till we're back together. He said, I love you so much that I even want to bless you right today. And he explains, I've I got to be away from you just for a little bit. It's just about that long. So be patient. Though you understand, I've got some children out here that I love dearly, and I want to bring them around to thinking about me. So be patient with me and my plan, God is saying to you. He said, I love you because you're, you've waited for me and waited on me, and that you're kicking those old rocks out of the path for others, that you're sowing a few seed along here and there. I just love you so much for that, but be patient. It doesn't matter that you're having a few problems, there is nothing that will prosper against you. Beloved, faith makes that a fact. And this one standing right before you is a prime witness of it because if you knew the hundreds and hundreds of television stations, and I'm not knocking them or talking against them, but I am glad I'm not saying this on the air, that will try to cast rocks in front of your path, it's a business world. And I mean, it gets right down there to the nitty-gritty when you start dealing with those people. Some of them are not Christian, and you can't talk to them like a Christian. You've got to talk a language they understand, or they may prosper against you all the way. So you, you for, the, for the waving the standard, you get in there and you mix it up. But do you know what I know for a fact? We're going to have our way. All we have to do is practice faith and know as long as we use good judgment. And, and don't be one of these people. Uh, it's the new year. I can take just a minute. I can take just a minute. 
sometimes, you know, you have types. You have a type, here's a brick wall, you know. That's the wall of life. Right? Our wall is supposed to be God. But we're supposed to do something. So you got to get through that wall. Well, you can either climb over it or you can go around it, but you've got the type that is, you know, boom, and they hit her just right head on, you know, and they'll bounce back. What happened? God was supposed to see me through. You know, uh, Try something three times. God hates a quitter. If he backs off, if he picked that way, God will let him do it. But if, he, if you don't bust through the third time, quit and go a different direction. Or I'm using the wrong terminology. Don't quit. But there's a better way than busting your head. Fly over it. All right? Or go around it. There's an easy way to make it. You know, oh well, I could say so many things. You can accomplish, I'm going to say it. You can accomplish, if, if you are relaxed and not uptight and not afraid of this world, I can make more money accidentally. I mean accidentally. than somebody can that's, <gasps> oh, Oh, it's a bad world. Oh, a person can't get ahead anywhere. Oh, I'm worried. How am I going to make my house payment? Oh, now, if you haven't got the money to pay it, I realize that's a problem. But you're the one that got yourself there. Recognize that fact first. You're the one that got yourself there. And do something about it. And you know what? This is a big secret. No, it won't happen again. It could be... the. In other words, you'll always have that rent money if you'll take plans and do something about it. Now, I just use that as an example, all right? Don't make life so rough on yourself in this modern age where we have the Word of God and everything is so easy. That is, if you like work. Now, I enjoy work, you know? I, I do. I love it. And if you'll work, everything will be easy. Now, that, there, the reason I say that, there's always some that will say, Oh, the pastor really knows his stuff. He said, I don't have to do nothing but think. <laughs> Thinking is good, but there's work always follows the think, all right? Okay, just, just throwing that in for the new year, all right? Have a good year. Make it good for yourself. Be relaxed and know God is in control. And it's your inheritance already, for Christ died on the cross and left you the will that you can inherit those good things if you'll have faith in them and know them and use this. And don't forget, he said, I will help you. I'm not going to do it myself. Isn't that what he said in that verse? That's what he said. I'm not going to do it myself, but I'll help you do it. It's your heritage. Well, you inherit it. If you don't go get it, I guess you like being without. All right? That's all I can say about it. So use your mind. It's not... It, Though it's a hard world, we're a lot harder than it is. Right? There are no giants out there. And I'll tell you what, if you strengthen your faith to that point, pretty soon it comes along that if you don't get a good challenge every once in a while, it can almost get boring. A good challenge to cause you to work your way through something and come out victor because you're always going to. Well, what about those times you fall back? That's practice. But remember, I'm going to say one more word on that. Why would you try three times? If you try one th time and fail, you're a quitter. You're just a flat, outright quitter. You pray about it and you try it the second time. And you wear back and you give it your all. If it fails that time, you say, Okay, Lord, I'm going to put a fleece up to you. And I just use that word meaning I'm going to put it in your hands. If I quit this time... If it doesn't work this time, I know you're going to open the door. You go for it, and if it fails that time, you say, Okay, Lord, I'm ready for something else. Let's find a different way. Because it's not going to work. Okay, Don't waste any more time with it. Find a better way. God doesn't like quitters, and he likes you to put your faith in him. Let's go to Hosea chapter 2. I, I love this chapter a little bit. We've kind of discussed who's going to be there. 
We've even brought the millennium into it a little bit about heaven. Heaven being with God. You know, the word... No, I won't go into the... Well, I'll go into the Hebrew a little bit. We use the word Shekinah glory. Shekinah. Well, that means God is there. That means His glory is shining. That, it's described as a rainbow in Revelation chapter 4. Then we have the last verse in the book of Ezekiel, which says, Yahweh Shema, God is there. Shema, Shekinah. There are so many words that His presence brings. Heaven is like unto that in a way, if you really go to the depth of it. Okay. Hosea chapter 2, verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. She's been bad in the verses up to this. I will allure. Have you ever done any courting? Nobody here done any courting? You don't know what that means? You know, if somebody is courting, they do crazy things. You know, oh, here, dear. You know, oh, please. Oh, isn't it a wonderful day? You know, before you say, i got to get to work, honey. I'll see you later. You know, you know. But when they court, the spring is in the step, you know, and in the voice and in the eye contact. God's going to do that to her. And in a way, He is now. You know, isn't that rather alluring, these great promises we've been reading this morning? He couldn't do much more. Okay, He's alluring her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortable, comfortably unto her. In other words, I'm going to be tender. That's what He's saying. Our Father, yep, wooing her in a tender way. And I will give her vineyards from thence in the valley of Achor for a door. Now, that's an interesting one there. Do you know what the word Achor is in the Hebrew? Trouble. I will give her the valley of trouble for a door. Have any of you ever felt like you had to go through the valley of trouble before you finally got to the door? I think so. But you're going through, all right? That's a good promise. Absorb it. Of hope. And she shall sing there. And in the days of her youth, and as in the day when she come up out of the land of Egypt. Boy, they came out of there. They had more goods than Egypt did. They got rich down there, okay? And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishai. That's husband. You're going to call me husband that day. Or companion. It means husband in the Hebrew. And shalt call me no more Behilah which is to say, Master or Lord. You're going to say, that's my husband. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beast of the field and with the fowls of the heaven and with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. Nothing ever to offend again. And I will betroth. You know what betroth means? And I will betroth thee unto me forever. I'm going to take you to wife forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. And when God does his court and he does it right, my friends, there will be nothing amiss. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know. Do you understand what faith is? Is one... Sometimes faith, you can say, well, I really wonder. He said, there won't be any wondering. Thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth. There you have heaven and earth combined. And the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. Jezreel is a Hebrew word that means it has to do with earth. It means to sow. God says, I'm going to plant the very best for you. And in a way, if you like, check it back in the Hebrew. You miss quite a bit because it creates a marriage between heaven and earth, if you would, giving the very natural order of things. Beautiful. And I will sow her unto me in the earth. Where's God going? Where is God going to put his crop? In the arets, the earth. And I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them that were not my people, Thou art my people, Lo Ruhama, in the Hebrew tongue. And they shall say, Thou art my God. 
It's coming, dear one. That's going to be heaven on earth. Well, we've got who's going to be there, where it is, and so forth. Heaven's going to be where? It's going to be right here on earth. But let's, that's all Old Testament stuff. Well, that's not really true. Because in closing, we're going to go one other place. And then we're out of here. All right? With more information and more knowledge of what they do in heaven, who is in heaven and where heaven is. Now, I'm going to be floating around out there. Well, don't make that silly statement anymore, okay? It's just not true. It's a fairy tale, all right? It's mythology. Stick to the facts. Chapter 21 takes you to the end of the millennium and the establishment of heaven and earth, the final establishment. You might say the final fix, Revelation 21. Now, with the knowledge that we have covered this morning, these verses need absolutely no explanation. Chapter 21, Revelation. And I saw a new heaven. That's the third one that Peter spoke of. And a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. This was written to flesh men, so it's talking about actually the second and the third, if you want to know the truth. But it says it was renewed. Not new, but it was renewed, rejuvenated, made right. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Here's that geographical location again. The rejuvenated Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Where's the bride going? Is the husband going to stay in heaven and the earth, his bride's going to be here on earth and they're going to live happily ever after? You all are enough nature to know it don't work that way. All right? He's coming with her, with the new, with the new way, for it is he that creates the new way, rejuvenates. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Is where? Is What is tabernacle? It's a house. God is living with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. That's forevermore. That's for the eternity. Right here, not floating around somewhere. That's where heaven is, and heaven is wherever God is, and thank God he will be with us at that time. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. That's where you're going, beloved. And I don't blame you. Uh, that's, that's, that's something to work forward to. But when you hear the word heaven, if, that's why we give things names is so that we can all relate to it. All right? And then after you name it, you describe it. For example, I used to have 360 acres out here this way, and there was one big old valley that we liked to snow sled and stuff like that in. It didn't have a name, and everybody would say, well, let's go over to the, that place there where that big tree comes up in that fork. And finally, a very wise thing happened. We said, let's call it Anna Valley. After that, it was very simple. We all went to Anna Valley to go sledding, or if you wanted to cut some of the biggest timber, well, that's, you went to Anna Valley. Well, it had, a, it had a definition and a meaning. Do you know that you're a lot that way to the Father? You need a name so that he can recognize you. I'm talking foolish in a sense, but I just want you to think a moment. You need a name whereby he can say to the angels, rather than, rather than having to say to the angels, you know, old, I want you to go help, uh, uh, not the blob or whatever. You know what I mean where that's all you see there. He gives you a name. You're somebody with him. All right? But he recognizes you a lot better when you recognize his promise to you of heaven because it's a promise, quite simply, of being with him. He loves that. You make him very happy when you let him know that you love him and when you're kicking a few of those old rocks out of the road, you know, to help the path improve. Everywhere you're, you walk, 
especially in this year, make it a better path for whoever follows you. There's not, it doesn't take that much effort. But you can taste a little bit of heaven right on earth today. Oh, you got to stand up and you got to protect your rights and you got to use this and you got to work. But kind of, that's what we were put here for. And you'll be real happy doing that. Heaven on earth for an eternity. Our Father loves you very much. So, when we think about heaven, let's visualize it that it's new and it's coming with Him. And we can even taste of it today, for He is already with us. And wherever He is, there's a little bit of heaven right there. Okay? Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for the privilege of being together in Your name. Thank You, Father, for these descriptions that You have placed in Your Word that lets us familiarize ourselves with who, when, where in relation to heaven. Be with us. We ask it in Yeshua's precious name. Amen.